Okay, here we go. So, this is uh, week eight after a long delay. This is scratch coding for testing your reflexes. And I know we already have one person who was able to reach the top. Um, I'm sure we're gonna have another one. So, just to recap, we've gone through these um, subject areas so far. Binary numbers, algorithms, how does the internet work? We animated your name, we've made it fly, we've had a virtual pet. We've made Conan the Librarian, but today we're gonna do the tower race. Next week, we're gonna try something brand new called a Monte Carlo simulation. That's gonna be really exciting. It might not be next week. I need some more time to prepare, prepare that one. And then I'd like to do something with Python and Java, just to give you a taste of those two. Um, and that might not be all either, because I know that um, we've got a little more time in this school year. Okay, but let's jump right into it. First off, how do we always start? with the Positivity Project. What is our Positivity Project goal for the week? Does anybody know? Oh, we got a couple of people. Okay, what is it? Oh, and we got two more. Um, I believe it's leadership. Aha, you would be correct. Leadership, you value each member of your group and inspire people to do their best. What's nice, by the way, about Blackboard is the first person to raise their hand is gonna be at the top of the list. So you gotta be quick on your button there. Good for you. Why is it important for a programmer? Why is it important for well, a programmer? Well, it's important for a programmer because if you're part of a team making something, you need to make sure everyone is organized and does their parts. Uh-huh, very good. Okay, well, here's a couple of ideas. Leaders come in all forms. And I think this is one thing that we really, as programmers, need to understand and respect. Anyone can be a leader. And sometimes we tend to gravitate towards certain people. We say, well, this person was a leader for this project. They're probably perfect for this new project. Sometimes that's not the case. Take your turn to be a follower too. You can help discover new leaders and it's actually a really good thing to do. So leadership is a really, I was thinking about this last night when I was making the slides. Leadership is a really tricky thing, and you, not need to you need to consider it as being a leader, but also being a follower sometimes. Not always a follower, but you can lead stuff, but you can also follow in stuff. And all projects need a leader um, and somebody to help get the, the thing organized together. All right. Please boot your laptops now, please. <laughs> How would you be watching this if your laptop wasn't booted? <laughs> you thought I wouldn't be joking today? You would be mistaken. <laughs> okay, sorry, the dad jokes will continue. Today's project, our project today. <laughs> Dude, our project today, we're gonna build a game that will test your reflexes. We will start by building it together. Maybe next time we meet, I really would love to see some of your remixes. Maybe we can even look at some of them and we'll watch them before we start into our next project, okay? And this is a perfect way of doing it when we meet online like this. The game is called Tower Race. It's located at this location and it's being shared. The goal is to press the space bar at the right time to stack the blocks. Can you reach the top? That's the challenge. Let's examine the game board. This is what it looks like when you start. Hmm. Hmm. It may not look like much now, you're right, but we're going to build on it. The key concepts, the new stuff we're going to talk about this time, detecting collisions, we're going to talk about stamping sprites onto the screen and how to dynamically increase the difficulty, okay? These are really important things because when you play a game, have you ever played a game where the first level is pretty easy and then the second level gets a little harder? And then the third level, a little harder. Then you meet a boss monster. And then the fourth level is really, really hard. That's the sort of thing we want to build into a game to make it more challenging. Bring the player in, make it really easy, and then increase the difficulty, increase the difficulty, and then make it pretty impossible at the end. We'll see that. Okay. Raise your hand if you remember the Create a Virtual Pet project we did all the way back on February 21st. Anybody remember that? Okay, one person remembers. Anybody else remember? Two? Come on, guys. Virtual pet project where we fed the fish. It had to, it had to go all the way over. 
there you go. You guys remember that. We fed that fish by putting, what did we use again? It was fruit salad, I think. We put fruit salad in the ocean and some of you put other food and we had that fish go over it. And what do we do when the fish swam over the food, it detected that it touched the food and then it ate the food, the food disappeared. That was collision detection and Sprite supports that. So how did we detect, I'm gonna change it to a laser pointer here. How did we detect that the fish had reached the food? It was collision detection. Scratch can trigger code when it detects that our Sprite has touched or collided with another object on the screen. But not just an object, we're gonna talk about this, okay? Let's start with just having a block go back and forth, okay? I want you guys to really think about this. Put your head back into Scratch. Let's talk a little bit. What are some variables? Variables we might need to do, you might need to have if we're gonna have a block moving back and forth. Think about that for a second. Speed, but also direction. People also pick direction too, and those are exactly the right answers. Score, not really, because you know what? As we go all the way up to the top, that's really gonna be the score. So if the block hits the top, that is our score. What are some values that the block itself can store? So we, we're gonna talk about what the sprites are and the, the block that moves back and forth is actually gonna be a sprite itself because it's moving, so it's a sprite, okay? But when it, when it has to stop and stamp itself on the screen, that's a stamp that doesn't move anymore. But then the sprite keeps on moving, okay? So the sprite is gonna know when it's going up. So it's gonna know its current X and its current Y. What is the current X, how far left to right it's going, and the current Y is how far up it is. So these are some values it's going to need to know as well. Okay, I wanna make sure that that makes sense to folks. Raise your hand if, that's, if, if any of this doesn't make sense. Okay, good. So now we're gonna talk about block code. Before we start writing the code, I want to talk about it in pseudocode. Um, in other words, other words that start with the word pseudo, pseudonym, pseudopod. Um, let me just do one more quick, quick poll. Has anyone ever seen the stem pseudo in a word? Ooh. Five, okay, six, all right. Seven. Okay. Okay. Good. So one of the people that have seen it, tell me what it means. What does pseudo mean? I'm pretty sure it means fake. Yeah. Yeah. Fake. Or false. Or false. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. So pseudo really means kind of made up kind of made up or false, yeah. So pseudocode is really a made up or false language of code. It's a way of us talking about code that isn't really structured like Scratch or Python or Perl or Java or C or Fortran or COBOL or Gopher or Miranda or Modula 2 or C Sharp or Visual Basic or, oh, I'm sorry, I got a little carried away there, <laughs> Never mind. Uh, it lets us talk about code in just words as opposed to having to write it in code, okay? Pro tip, it's also really portable. If you can take your idea or your algorithm and describe it just in words, and just in words, you can express it to another programmer and that programmer can take your, that idea and write it in whatever language he or she is really good at. So, you can consider that pseudocode is like a fake language or a, a easier language to describe something that people can now use to program your idea or your algorithm. Okay, does that make sense? So, here's a word from our sponsor. Okay, you ready? Pseudocode. In computer science, pseudocode is an informal high-level description of the operating principle of a computer program or other algorithm. It uses the structural conventions of a normal programming language, but is intended for human reading other than machine reading. Wikipedia. Does that help? <laughs> I don't think so. Not very much at all, actually. 
But when I read this, I'm like, hmm, uh, let's think. Huh. Hang on. Well, let's see. Informal. Ah, informal. That's good. High level description. High level. We're not really trying to get into the nuts and bolts. We're trying to just say, hey, at, what's the gist of it? And intended for human reading. That's the whole point of it. We want to just describe what we're trying to do. Okay? Here we go. So we're back to my classic joke. And this is something in the title, Algorithm. Okay? When this game starts forever, we're going to wait the current delay seconds. So that's a variable. In, in the style of, al of al in the style of pseudocode that I use, I make my variables in italics like this. So they're kind of slanted. So we're going to wait the current delay seconds. If we're going right, if we're moving to the right, we're going to increase the X location. So hopefully my point right is going right on your screen. <laughs> if we've hit the wall, we're going to reverse direction and start going the other direction. And likewise, if we're going left and we hit the wall, we're going to reverse direction, and we're now we're going that way. Okay, so that's basically all we're going to do for the the, the block bouncing back and forth on the screen. That's our that's our algorithm for the bouncing block. I want to just make sure that that when we look at this, there's no scratch code here, but it describes our very simple algorithm for how we're going to have a block go back, back and forth on the screen. Okay. Now we're going to take our algorithm and we're going to convert it into Scratch. And this is the part I want you guys to focus on. When you receive an algorithm from somebody, sorry, I should have said pseudocode. When you get pseudocode, think about how you would take that pseudocode and how you would convert it into the language that you're good at. Maybe it's Scratch, maybe it becomes Python or Java or one, any of those other languages I was talking about. So here we go. When the game starts, here it is. And by the way, I really still like to use those messages. Action, action is when the game starts. Forever, well, we know what that means. We're gonna wait the current delay right up here. If we're going right, well, in this case, I have a variable called direction flag. And if direction flag is zero, it means we're going right. If we're going right, then increase location. There it is. Change the X by 48. Now, by the way, when I say change the X by 48, where is this code living in? This block of code is living in what object? Can somebody tell me which block of code this, this where, where would I find this code inside my project? Would it be attached to the background? Um, I'm not entirely sure, but maybe um, it would be in the sprite. Yes, absolutely it would be in the sprite. This, this code would be inside that little block that's going back and forth. Because when we say we're changing the X, we're changing the X of this little sprite, the block. So when we say, hey, change your X, this block is going to go bloom, bloom, bloom. You're exactly right. Bang on, spot on, okay? So that's exactly right. When, we, when we're going right and we increase our location, this line right here, oops, this line right here changing the X by 48, that is moving the sprite, that block. Good job. And then if we've hit the wall, it says if X position is greater than 185, if it's gone past that wall, we've got to come back. So the direction flag is set to 1. And remember, if it's 0, it's going to the right. If it's 1, it's going to the left. Okay, that's why the code is set up. And I left the else out just so that this whole thing here would fit on the screen, this whole block of code. Okay? I really want to make sure that you guys get the, the feeling that pseudocode, if you take a look, I was able to write the whole pseudocode for what we're doing on one page on the previous slide, but here I had to stop and leave out the else because it doesn't fit in Scratch because Scratch has these big blocks. Okay? So let's go on to the second part. We, sorry, we reverse direction, which is here. So let's take a look at the set. So do you see how pseudocode really translates directly into code? It's no longer just fake code. It's no longer just pseudocode. It's real code now. So let's see if we can go something. 
You may have noticed if you read the slide, we're only going to the right. We need that code that's gonna go back in the other direction. So let's do that next. So when the game starts, okay, forever, wait the seconds and then going right, this is the stuff we looked at before, but now we're gonna do the else statement. So if we're going right, do this, else we're going left. So we're gonna change the X by negative, negative 48. And now if our X position decrease X location, if we've hit the wall, we check the X position being low, lower. Now here's something that I'm not sure if anybody noticed, but I just did. On the other side, when we're going to the right, we say if the X position is greater than 185, turn back. But here we're saying if it's less than 172, negative 172, go back. So that might be a little bit of a bug, okay? We reverse direction, and there we go. Okay, so most people are, are getting it pretty good for reading the pseudocode, and um, we're gonna keep going. So when we look at the game board, I wanna talk about, when we look at all of this, what elements are sprites here? I'm pretty sure this is, it's a button, right? And as was pointed out, the block, which is moving on the screen, that's a sprite. Um, normally, you would say that things that people are interacting with, things that I would click on, or things that are gonna move, or things that are gonna appear and then disappear, appear, then disappear, those are sprites. But what about, what about the walls on each side? Are those sprites? Huh. What do you guys think? Should they be sprites or how are we gonna detect that the block as it moves back and forth has hit the wall? Well, from the pseudocode, how do we detect that we were hitting a wall? We could say detect if the block is touching the color black. And then we wouldn't need to test if the X location is greater than 185 or less than 180, negative 185. We could just say, hey, are you touching that black wall on the right hand side or the black wall on the left hand side? But we didn't do it. I didn't do it that way. Hmm. So it doesn't matter that the sides of the gameplay area have black stripes. I tried to trick you. Did it work? Fine. OK, we'll do it. So if you wanted to use color detection instead, it would look almost the same. And in fact, it would be more flexible. We could do it just like this. If we wanted to find out if we're touching the wall, we're changing the X by 48. And now if we're touching the color black or whatever the color is for that side wall, that side wall, then we can say up, oh, turn around, you hit the wall. That's all it would look like to make that change, to have it turn back when it bounced off that wall, we would just say, hey, if you hit the color of that wall on this side, or when you're going over here, if you hit the color of the wall on that side, boom, you know that you need to turn back. Does that make sense, I hope? When I first wrote this game in 2010, the color detection was buggy, okay? So you can't really fault me on that. Um, all right, so we have a block. We've got a block that's going back and forth. That's the state of our game so far. Not a very amusing game thus far, right? How does the player drop the block? Well, they press the space bar. They say, okay, I'm ready to drop the block. I hit the space bar. How do we detect they have pressed the space bar in Scratch? I gave it away. When space key is pressed, okay. What is that code gonna look like? Let's talk pseudocode first, right? We always wanna start, we, I want us to start talking as a, as a, as a class, pseudocode first because it's more compact and it also starts us to think logic um, instead of just sort of flailing code at it. So when the space key is pressed, if the game over is zero and this is a new variable, why would I wanna check if the game is, o game is over um, equals zero? I'm gonna throw this question out, just open-ended. 
Does anybody have an idea why I would want to check if the game is over before I even listen to the space bar? Anybody have an idea? Why would I care if the space bar is pressed if the game is over? Maybe it would um, reset the game so you could play it again. Ah, good idea, good question. So um, in the way that I, I built this game initially, I said, look, if the game is over, I don't want them just to keep hammering on that space key like a maniac. I want them to have to hit another key that says, hey, I know I lost or I know I won, let's start a new game. So the space key is really just to control when to drop the block, but I want them to press a different sprite or a different action to restart the game. So if the game's over, I just want to ignore it when they hit the space key. Yeah, okay? So um, if the game's over, we're not gonna do anything. We're just going to ignore them. So um, if the game is over is zero, means the game is still in action, OK? So if the game is still in action, and this block, I need a block in my hand, I think. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll use some, I'll use some air, or air, air pods. So if the block is still moving, then I want to say, how far is it from the current stack? Well, if there's no, if there's no current stack, and I push the space bar, where is the stack? Wherever I put the, wherever the current block is, right? So if this is the first time I've hit the space bar, then it's here. If it's the first time I hit the space bar, it's here. Wherever the, the, the block is on the first level, that's where it's going to be. That's where the tower is going to start. But now it goes up a level. And now I've got to make sure I match the current tower that's underneath it. So I go up a level and it starts going back and forth. And now if I press the space bar here, there's no tower underneath it. So I have to calculate how far is this away from where the last tower was. I need to calculate the difference between the actual tower and where my current sprite is. And I'm called that the diff x. Find the distance from the current stack. We want to say how far away are we from where the stack currently is, right? If the difference is more than 30, so the, this, this, this stack is 30, 30 wide. If it's 30, means I've missed it. If it's less than 30, then I'm close enough to be on it. Does that make sense? It's, I, I, I arbitrarily said 30 is about close enough, and I'll say, okay, you, you made it. You're, you're good enough. So I say stamp the current tower, increase the height, Maybe I need two. Okay, here you go. Here, here's my current tower. Here's my new tower, or my new block. I go along. I say, oh, I'm close enough. Stamp it. So now this stays here. And now I make a new, I have a new block going back and forth. And if I get it, stamp it. And now a new block going back and forth. So stamping the current tower just leaves an imprint of that sprite on the screen. Okay, it makes a picture of it, stamps it on the screen. We've not talked about stamping before. It's a really powerful thing in, in, in Scratch. Increase the height, check if the game has been won, and then this is the, the key thing. Um, one of the people at the beginning said that they had beaten the game. Well, we can fix that. We can decrease the wait time by even more. We can make it more and more challenging, okay? I ch I'm gonna challenge you to do that. Right now, we are decreasing the wait time by a certain amount. We can decrease it by even more, okay? So, now that we know what we want to do for the space key, let's convert this to scratch code. So when the space key is pressed, um, not there. <laughs> okay. Uh, when the space key is pressed, if the game over is zero, calculate the diff x, which is somewhere here. Set the variable to show that the game is over if they've missed it. Okay, so if this is the code for the, the game being over. If the game really is over, let's broadcast. Hey, the game's over. Why do we need to broadcast? This whole concept of shouting out messages, when do we have to use that? Um, do, do you all remember that? When in Scratch we say broadcast a message, why do we have to broadcast messages? Um, I believe we might need broadcast if you're 
changing like everything so like if you're resetting the game and have to have multiple things go back to the um where they were before or just yeah i think that um you would have to broadcast messages when something needs to change or just happen in general mm -hmm. okay good how about and, and sorry there was one more person um, i think those are right yeah. sorry no go ahead please. i think that's right and you need to broadcast messages because um the computer won't like automatically tell everything else that this one thing happened so you need to broadcast mm -hmm. it when the game is over the sprite my airpods <laughs> the sprite is going to stop moving but we want to say to the player hey the game's over and that's going to be a message that's going to appear and that's a sprite over here that's got to change its state so when we broadcast all the other things in the in the game the background the other sprites they can be listening for that message so all of you had exactly the right answer it doesn't necessarily mean the game or the, all the, the game is over um, in this case it does right but when we broadcast a message it's just to help coordinate to have other objects on the screen even if they're not visible understand hey something's happened that i might need to pay attention to and that's what messaging is all about in in, in scratch and in most other languages you broadcast a message so that other items know there's something that might need to get done so you guys are getting it you guys are really 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 doing a good job of understanding great job okay so we're broadcasting game over we're stopping all sounds we're hiding the sprite block we're saying look dude it's over we're playing that awesome sound that you heard and we're stopping all scripts okay okay so let's play it real quick oh, and i'm not very good Oops. so i'm not very good at my own game okay here we go Whew. oh boy I got, i'm a little anxious now <laughs> oh no Ow. okay Okay, so what happened? When I lost the game, this go button appeared, the press here to play again appeared, the game over message appeared. So really, this sprite disappeared from the top and it made one, two, three other things reappear. Okay, so in fact, it's really, it's really that, that broadcasting of that message affected Three, oh, I'm, I'm lagging, I think. That broadcast of that message affected three other objects to change how, they're, how they behaved. And that's the important part I wanted to show, okay? Um, I'm just gonna pull open uh, over here and just, just show a little bit more. We've got the sprite itself, which is this. We've got the go button. We have the game state up here. We've got the play again message. I put the play again message in there because people got confused saying, game's over, what do I do? And I said, there's a button that says go. Um, is that not clear enough? Okay, so I put this big message saying, press here to play again. Um, and if you look at this message, this sprite that says game state, it's got two costumes. One says you win, and the other one says game over. So depending on whether they won the game or not, that's what that turn, that's what sets that message showing or not. Lastly, this go button, all it does is it's either showing to say start the game or it's hiding itself when the game is in play. Okay? I'm gonna go back to the slides. We just have a couple of slides left and then we'll um, we'll go more of it back into the code, if you wish. Okay. So here again we walk through this. This is when you loot, when, when you, uh, <clears throat> if the difference is more than 30, in other words, which I just demonstrated. So here's the tower, here's my block. I pushed the, I pushed the space bar too far away. I missed the tower and it said, oh, game over and it played that lovely sound. Okay. Now, if we're still playing the game and we didn't miss it, we do this. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this before. The green, in the green section, there's a thing called stamp. 
and that says take this current sprite and put it on the on this on the background just stamp it on there and then let me move the sprite and use it again okay so stamping is really useful it says take a picture of what that sprite looks like and just leave it on the screen it's really useful okay and then after we stamp it we're going to increase the y by 50 we're going to increase the y when we increase the y where does it go up or down up and then we decrease the wait time we make it faster wait time here and then so wait time to wait time times 0.85 and then we say check to see if the game has been won now this is where I remember at the beginning I said do we need a variable to see if the person's score well really if, as soon as you get this block you start at the bottom as soon as you manage to get that block above 150 you've won so we don't really need to keep track of what level you're on we just need to know where the, the block is on the game and that's where we say aha you've won and we just broadcast that so the logic is a little bit tighter okay okay making things smaller so I kind of gloss that over how do you make a number smaller subtraction good you can just subtract from it that's one or you can multiply it by a number that's less than 1.0 right when I do this wait time to wait time times 0.85 what's really happening okay so really how much are we reducing wait time by well we're taking 85% of this number and so 15% of that number is going poof. so we're reducing it by 15% when we when we take 85% of the number so if you take if the whole number is here and you remove 15% of that pie then you're left with 85% of that number so that's how we make things smaller and it's proportionate if we were to say minus you know 20 every time then if we change the size of things, um, it would, then it wouldn't scale properly. This says, if we start with 100, it'll shrink, it'll shrink, it'll shrink. Every time it's gonna shrink by the same percentage as opposed by a fixed number. So technical, but that's how I wanted it to do. Now, to answer the very question at the very beginning of this meeting, or this, to, this pre class session, somebody said that the game was too easy okay whoever said that change this variable this 0.85 change that to 0.75 okay and then I want to challenge you to see if you can solve the game I really want to see if you can solve it I know that kids usually have amazing reflexes compared to um, more seasoned warriors <clears throat> okay so other sprites so far we've only spoken about sprite one great name right I named it myself so over here this is sprite one that's the block doesn't look for like very much but boy does it do a lot of work we also have go button great name game state and play again so go button if you click this you get to play again game state shows you if you win or lose and play again tells the player to click the go button it's just a hint it says hey down here there's a button you should click it <laughs> okay so what are the messages that these buttons should they should respond to or what what events how how should these things act let's go through this when should the go button we have this go button should it listen to when the the, the um, green flag gets pushed When the green button is pushed, let's look back over here. So this is the initial state here. When the green flag is pushed, the game starts. Should the go button know about that? So if I click on code, are we gonna see anything for the green button? Ah, you think that the go button should broadcast action hmm okay that's a that's a really really good point um, let's take a look 
And you know that in Scratch you can zoom out too to sort of see, just to double check, is there any other code down there? There isn't, in fact. Nothing. So what exactly is it doing? Well, when this sprite is clicked, it broadcasts action and then it stops. That's all it does. So the go button actually kind of stays there. It doesn't listen for the green flag. You see how the go button, it actually just stays there. It might be that when we start the game, we should hide that button. That would be a nice improvement, wouldn't it? But as it currently stands, you're quite, quite right. So when I click it, look, it starts, it starts the music, but it doesn't really do anything else useful with life. Okay, so on the slide, the go button doesn't do anything on this. Does it do anything with game over? No. Game one? No. Sprite clicked? Yes. When you, when you click on it, it is broadcasting action. Okay. I like to make tables like this, tables like this, because it helps me in my mind sort of look at the objects, the sprites on the screen and say, what is going to have an actual effect? What is the user going to push on to actually make the game respond to them, to have it do something interesting? So sometimes it's useful because then you can say game state. What is that game state? Game state is this one. Oops, I just gave it away. <laughs> when I click the green button, do I want this to be visible? No. When I start the game, I, you don't win the game when you first start it, right? It should be hidden. So when I click the green arrow, green flag, it hides itself right away. It used to be, by the way, in older Scratch, and again, remember, this is Scratch that is 10 years old. You had to put at the end of your script, you had to say, stop this script. And so you'll notice that in most of my scripts, you'll see at the bottom, when this is clicked, do something, and then stop this script. You don't have to do that anymore, I don't think, with the most recent Scratch. Okay, so when this is clicked, you hide it. When I receive game over, it does this. And when I receive game one, it does this. So again, this is a great example of, I'm listening for a message. Oh, game over? Oh, and they lost? Bummer, man. Changes the costume to say game over. And then it shows it, makes sure it's visible on the screen, and then it stops this script. If I receive game one, it shows, hey, you won the game, congratulations. And then it stops this script, okay? So now we've covered the go button, we've covered the game state. How about the play again button? Where's the play again button? Or click play again. That's this one over here. Yeah, I'm gonna stop this. Play again is right here. Well, same thing as the you win, when we start the, the green flag, we don't want that to show, right? Because when you first start the game, we don't say, hey, you want to play again? That's dumb. If I, go, if I start playing a game, if I fire up, uh, I don't even know what a popular video game is anymore. <laughs> if I fire up a video game and I start, it says, hey, do you want to play again? I'm like, dude, I just started. Like, get out of my way. So no, that has to hide. So when we say, when we say start, the green flag start, we hide it. And when I receive game over, I have to show it. And when I say game one, I have to show it. Now, when is it gonna hide that thing? Well, what happens? How do I know to hide that when I do start a new game? Ah, this might be a bug. Interesting. <laughs> Let me just try this for a second. Here, we start a game. If we win all the way to the top, watch this. I'm gonna, I'm going to stop it here, and then I'm going to go back to the sprite, and I'm going to click, click. This is a cheat, by the way. Okay, now I hit go again. Oh no! 
Okay, there's a bug, and I challenge somebody to fix it, okay? So what happens is if you win the game and you say play again, has anybody won the game and then pressed play again and it worked properly? It worked for you? Okay, okay, thank you. So maybe it's just because I was trying to test it on the fly and everybody knows that live demos never work. So, okay, thank you for that. <laughs> okay, back to the slides where it's safe. I want you to look over this list here and just make sure you understand when buttons should be clicked and when they should um, ignore clicks and actions. Because if you have too many things that are responding to the green flag and to messages, your programmers are going to start. Your program is going to start to get too busy, and it's going to bog down, and sometimes get a little laggy. And does anybody here like lag? I know I don't. Okay, moving right along. If you stack the blocks all the way to the top, here's what it looks like. We just went through that. It says you win. The sound that it plays is an Australian instrument called a didgeridoo. Did you learn something new? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I had to put it in there. <laughs> okay, wrap up, guys. What are some improvements we could make in this game? I really want you to take a few minutes and put some ideas into chat. I want to hear what you guys think we could do to improve this. So we could make it fun. Who said that? Nice. Create a few more levels of increasing difficulty. I like that. Make the steps smaller for increased difficulty. Okay. Make it so if part of the block hangs off, the part that's hanging off gets cut off and you have to stack smaller blocks. I love that idea. That's brilliant. Very good. The nice thing about doing it in Scratch is that this is in your control, right? You guys have the power to make this game and to play with it and, and then share it, remix it. So it actually is kind of empowering for you to be able to do these things, right? And I do not profess to be the world's best scratch pro scratcher either, for sure. Love to see what you guys come up with. Okay, I'm going to go through the list in terms of what I, some of the ideas that I had. Um, let's just sort of see what we have. Maybe a high score list, right? To see how fast you make it to the top. Have a timer. Have it detect the screen edges. You know what you could do is you could say, hey, as you go up, the screen edges come in more, more like this. Or the screen edges go out. Have there be more levels, just like somebody was saying before. Have different shaped blocks. We can make the blocks different shapes, like a trapezoid maybe, or like, like uh, yeah, like this. No, a trapezoid would be like this. <laughs> or a, a um, parallelogram. Maybe have background music while you play. Make it timed. Yes, absolutely. You could also speed up much more aggressive. Let's just try one thing here, okay? I'm gonna reset this. And you see what our timing was here. Um, um, where's the time? Yeah, here's the time up here. Actually, let me just go back to here, my stuff. I made a copy of this one just so I could, I could test it. So let's, let's change the timing thing. So instead of 0.85, we're gonna say 0 0.75, okay? So let's just see if this changes the game, okay? So here we go. We're playing now at 0 0.75. Ooh, that's a little bit faster. Still getting pretty fast. Okay, okay, I got that. That one was okay. Ah, see, it was a bug for me. Hmm. Okay, so that maybe that's too easy still. So let's go like this. 0 0.5. Now, this is going to be pretty much impossible, I think. Let's find out. Ready? <laughs> so, 0 0.5. I'm going to challenge somebody to try to win the game at speed at the factor of 0 0.5 because that's speeding up a lot every single turn. Okay? Okay, so there, here's some ideas. This um, PowerPoint will be um, posted so you're, you'll be able to have access to it. Um, and I would love, absolutely love to see what you guys come up with. Um, if you're comfortable sharing it into the class, 
um, class gallery inside Scratch or just send the URL for next class, okay? But I really think that uh, we have some great ideas here and it would be fantastic to see what we come up with, okay? So, uh, we will not be meeting next week. Okay, well, that is all we've got for today. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, thank you for taking the time to join right. us this morning. All right, thank you very much, everyone.